have been talking about the methyl characterization. I intend to spend some time on geometrical characterization. And just for your quick review, geometrical is something which is naturally available or even man made. So, we do not differentiate between these and uh, naturally occurring materials could be rocks, soils, even ground water falls in the category of geomaterial. And even you know, man made resources like fly ash, cement, different type of resins, different type of admixtures which you are using in the concrete or in soils these days and chemicals sometimes. They all fall in the same category. These are all geomaterials. In principle, anything which is coming out of the earth, geo is a material of interest to us. Fine. As long as we are working in this domain on the earth. So, now my uh, theme of discussion would be how to characterize geomaterials. What I intend to do is I would like to talk about the need for geometrical characterization which I have already done in the previous lecture, why you need to characterize the material, this is well understood. Being a geotechnical engineer, I thought of you know linking geotechnical properties with all other attributes of the materials, fine. So, geotechnical properties are mostly engineering properties. Suppose you are trying to create a pavement. So, we talk about the compressibility of the soil, we talk about the load bearing capacity of the soil, we talk about the cyclic loading of the soil, we talk about the liquefaction potential of the soil, we talk about the stiffness of the material, we talk about the drainage characteristics of the material, we talk about the creep and all these things. So, all these properties put together are the engineering, you know attributes which are associated with the material. In other words, if I want to understand how this material is going to behave when I apply load on this, these properties will become useful, fine. So, this is the prime property which I will be looking for and I will be linking this property with other attributes of the geomaterial in series is microbiological. Uh, this is where if you remember sometime back we were talking about the biogeo interface. How biogeo interface is becoming a matter of great concern to civil engineers, geotechnical engineers. I have been giving lot of logics and examples I have been citing. Uh, what I will show you is how this type of examination is done and what is the relevance of this. Sometime back I think I had given you some hints that why microbiological examinations are required. We were discussing about a situation where everything was done perfectly all right, mechanistic models were in place, but even then system failed, clear. So, few years back maybe people used to attribute or subscribe this to act of God. But now when you take samples from such type of failures and you go into the microscopic examination, you realize that this is a different realm of activities which is happening in the material. And that is the reason this microbiological examination is becoming an integral part of our subject, particularly for the guys who are into forensic analysis of the systems and the failures. It is a hot topic and many of us are still learning it. So, we are not an expert, but yes we have some knowledge and I can share with you. But a lot is required to develop it and to implement it in day to day practice of civil engineering and geotechnical engineering. Then comes the mineralogy, alright. How minerals which are present in the material uh, contribute to a phenomena, a mechanism, a property of the material, clear? It is just like human body. When your minerals are not balanced, you know body is not balanced, clear? So, you have problems. The same thing happens in soils also. 
then we can do medication also we can do long term monitoring also so mineralogy becomes very important i'll spend some time on this because of the fact that most of the properties of the geomaterials are because of the minerals which are present in them and i hope you will realize this that mineralogy is also associated with morphology morphology is the physics of the material Mineralogy is too much of the chemistry of the material. All right. So how the material appears to be is the morphology, physical dimensions of the material. And then I'll show you how mineralogy governs over the morphology, or sometimes it could be vice versa also. Then comes the physical attributes, which are again a part of the physics of the material. Here we talk about either the bulk or we talk about the surface. So either we try to understand what's happening at the surface of the material or what's happening with the bulk of the material. So biogeo interface is a sort of a surface phenomena where any bioactivity is going to harm or going to sustain itself on the surface of the material. Clear? And then onwards the interaction starts. So I'll talk about the physical attributes and the physical characterization techniques which are normally used these days to understand the material in a better way. Now this will be followed by the chemical examination, fine. So I am sure you must be getting a feel that as if you are entering into a polyclinic. So before you see the doctor, what you are supposed to do? You are supposed to do all this pathological examination, a series of examination. And once the series of examination is done, your report is ready, diagnosis can be done, treatment can be done subsequently. So long monitoring can be done subsequently. Efficiency monitoring can be done subsequently. Are you realizing this? The whole domain gets opened up and that's becoming very, very interesting for people like us. And that's the importance of understanding the material. So we want to understand the chemistry or the chemical response of the material or chemical attributes of the material. Now this is where pore solution sampling is becoming a very important integral part of the whole concept. I am sure you can realize pore solution is sampling is nothing but taking out your blood samples, serum samples. You understand? <laughs> a lot of similarities there. So the whole diagnostics today in the medical sciences is based on blood sampling, serum sampling, is it not? And after that what do they do? They do sequencing of DNA, RNA and all those things and they do complete analysis of the situation, forensic, forensic examination. So pore solution sampling, people have spent a lot of time. Corrosion potential is a very important thing, which is a chemical attribute of the geomaterial. So the more and more civilization is taking place, the more and more infrastructure is being developed. How corrosive soils are or change the context in how much corrosive environment they are going to be, both ways, you understand? Either the soils are corrosive themselves or they are exposed to a very corrosive environment, fine. Now how this system is going to behave is very, very important. Uh, this is where sorption, desorption becomes very important. I will not talk about this, these are, these are the geomechanics part of environmental, geo-environmental engineering. But I just wanted to give you a flair of, you know, what is happening in the subject. So when you take a medicine, what is the mechanics of this medicine when it goes into, into your body? Can you start analyzing it now? So what do you do? You take medicine, <coughs> you swallow it and drink some water and then goes in the stomach. What happens then onwards? Mostly the medicines are a chemical activity, clear? So the moment there is a concentration grab, oh sorry, gradient, what is going to happen? There will be a diffusion, clear? So the diffusion started from high concentration, it goes into the blood, the fluid phase or the gaseous phase which is present in the system and the concentration would like to equilibrate it. So this is how the medicine goes in your blood. Fine. We call this as a 
diffusion phenomena. What is the role of the vessels or the veins which are containing the blood? Now this has become a surface and whatever activity is taking place is across the surface. It is a flux migrating through a surface, clear? So unless surface is receptive, you got my point? Unless surface is reactive, receptive, no flux can enter through it. So sorption is a phenomena where the chemical activity goes and gets assimilated into a surface or in any entity. We say this is a sorption process. This material has got sorbed. Is this okay? From this point onwards, the geomechanics starts to talk about how much is the sorption capacity of the material. What will be the application? Suppose if I am designing the good barrier systems for nuclear waste, where the nuclear waste is being the dumped into the geoenvironment, soils or rocks, and then the chemical activity migrates like you know medicine in the stomach. Now, if the material is not active, if it is not sorbing, this activity is going to live there forever, which is detrimental. You understand this point? So this is the modern, you know, status of geotechnical engineering. I am using the words more and more, you know, mechanics now. You must have realized, until now in the course, I have not used the word mechanics many times. That was just to give you a exposure of the situation where we are, you know, going to deal with. Now the real situation is coming where the contact is going to take place, interaction is going to take place and hence mechanics is going to get involved, fine. The reverse process of this process where the something goes and sits on the surface is desorption, oozing out of calcium from your bones when you age, clear? And then what happens? Osteoporosis, we call it, clear? Mostly it happens after a certain age in human body. It is a reverse process. Right now, at this age, when you take curd, when you take milk, when you take calcium supplements, what is happening in the body? Body has a tendency to retain it, sorb it. You understand? This is a sorption process. Based on this, I can define the age of your tissues. I can define the age of your body. The reverse is going to happen once this process stops, the capacity of the body to solve something has stopped and the reverse process starts. So whatever was retained is being now discharged, desorption. So when you design filters of different types, this could be flue gases coming out of the chimney, this could be the flue gases in the parking lot, all dehumidifiers which you are using, clear? They work on this principle. Now, all micropores, they have a tendency to capture the particles of dust, particles of smoke, particles of fumes and so on at molecular level. Clear? The whole thing when we do in an engineering manner, we study under the realm of micromechanics of porous media. Type it and check how many types of information you will get, books, papers, how many people are working all over the world, God knows. Micromechanics of porous media. Porous media is geomaterial, having some porosity. The steel is not a porous media, clear? Metals are not a porous media. Well, I can do indentation and I can create a porous system out of it, clear? So they are not naturally occurring porous systems. Porous systems are rocks, soils and the type of admixtures which you are creating, fly ash, silica fumes, concrete, different type of composites and so on. So all these type of discussions normally we do when we want to do a modeling to understand what will be the impact of contaminants on the geoenvironment under EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment. Long back when we were discussing, I had 
given your idea that if I dump the waste over here, what's going to happen at a distance? Clear? So when I want to do this type of analysis, I have to go into these micro details of the metallurgics. Now moving on from chemical, we would like to understand how thermal responses are responsible. You know, when they, when the geometrical comes in contact with thermal flux. Most of the situations which we deal with in today's world as a geotechnical engineer is a situation where soils and rocks and groundwater come in contact with heat. Can you name some examples? Can you cite some examples? Good. Geothermal energy. Apart from this, in day to day life, that is very good, but that is a slightly intricate thing. Simple things. Power cables. Yes, you are right. So, when you are laying the power cables, heat gets emitted and geometrial soil rock directly comes in contact with the heat. Fine. And then there is a big science behind this. I do not know whether you have realized or not. Power engineers or power electronics guys need your help as a geotechnical engineer to give you the parameters which are conducive for laying a particular type of cable underground. You must have realized that most of the advanced nations and cities in the world have power transmission underground. Is this correct? Why? Yes, so that could be one issue. Yes, you are right that suppose in the coastal areas you cannot take a risk of you know um, overhead transmission of power from one place to another place. It becomes a big headache. Highly populated cities, who will maintain wires every day, clear? And power theft in certain parts of the country, you just go. I mean, you can see the photographs. What do they do? They just connect wires. So, you want to stop all these things. You are a developed nation, you are a developed society. All transmission should be underground. So, when you do thermal, sorry, underground transmission of electricity, this problem is going to come. I cited this example sometime back. In mining, yes, there could be a situation apart from mining. Landfills, I think we talked about this. Chemical reactions might occur in landfills and the entire system might get heated up. And then the whole thing is sitting on the formation, clear? So there is a heat source and this heat will migrate either inside the landfill material or in the foundation part. Apart from this, Tanks which you are designing for storing water, for storing different type of hydrocarbons, chemicals. There are huge, huge tank forms. Have you ever seen a tank form? Go to any port area, BPCL, IOCL, and there are huge tank forms. I mean, like first of all, area wise, and each tank would be 60 meter diameter. 60 meter, can you imagine? And like this, there is so many tanks which are going to be in one tank form. Insulation is a big problem. If your foundations are emitting heat during summers, what is going to happen? Whatever contained is inside, this is going to become volatile number one. Number two, it may cavitate. Reverse situation may also happen. Outside is very cold. The heat may migrate. The entire system may freeze. These are the problems which we are facing. Can you realize this? The type of problem that geotechnical engineers are facing right now. So the engineers, you have never thought about all this, no? Why? Hmm? These are the contemporary issues. Are you getting a point on which people are not giving any serious thoughts? Nuclear waste. So the moment you dump it inside the ground, what is going to happen? process, you know, or the waste itself has high temperatures and these temperatures are going to be there inside the ground. Again, thermal gradient you have created. So what is going to happen? The moment gradient gets created, heat will migrate. All right. Apart from this, any other idea which comes to your mind? Different types of ground improvement activities where you are inserting chemicals into the soil. Chemical reactions are taking place, heat is migrating. Different type of 
agricultural activities. What are the constituents of fertilizers? Manure. Chemicals, they might react with the constituents of the soil and they may produce heat. Underground explosions, somebody has talked about mining. You talked about mining, yes that is correct. So, mining is always followed by underground explosions first, clear. So, when you are exploding something, lot of heat gets generated, where this heat is going ultimately. So, you have to design all these things, you have to design thermal barriers. Yeah, so whenever you do ground modification by using chem uh, line particularly where heat of hydration is important, chemicals clear, chemicals having heat of hydration. The moment you mix in the soil, what will happen on the surface? Cracking. So, you are creating an highway and what will happen? It will crack. Are you realizing applications? Different types of solar ponds which you are designing for aquaculture, pisciculture. It is a big business, is it not? In the coastal regions, they do aquaculture, pisciculture, what else they do? They grow shrimps and what not. Is this correct? So, how do you design the foundation for this type of systems? You never thought about it. So, for, for these ponds to work properly, what should be the preliminary condition? Very good. Number one is temperature. Number two, pH I can control, I will put fresh water, okay. Yeah, but pH may change over a period of time, you are right. Okay, next. How do you design ponds in which you are going to have aquaculture? Come to the basin. The bottom most part, if you want to maintain the BOD, COD of the water, what you have to do? Either keep adding chemicals or grow underwater vegetation. What is that vegetation? Algae. Clear? Algae becomes a food for aqua life. Agreed? Now, what <laughs> see there are two, three problems now which we are talking about. So, when you are designing this type of ponds, first of all heat should not go out of the system from the foundation. Second thing is you are going to grow some nutrition and food for the aqua life at that temperature. So, somebody was talking about the temperature effect, clear? You have to maintain the temperature, that is right, so that some vegetation can be grown. It is a big science, I hope you can realize now. Designing tanks for any type of culture is not easy and there is a lot of heat involved into it. You have to contain the heat, you have to insulate the entire foundation system so that the heat which is coming from the solar energy form does not get dissipated from the sides of the tank. Yeah. I am sure you must have realized how, how many examples I have cited and everywhere soil is involved or rock is involved or water is involved. These are geomaterials, fine. So, it becomes very, very important to understand how geomaterials are going to perform under thermal flux. Another example which I forgot to cite is the nuclear waste which is being generated from different units has to be disposed of somewhere. All the time you cannot go 100, 200 meter deep and dump it over there. So, most of the time what do they do is, they put it in the vaults which are made up of concrete. These are concrete canals you can say or concrete burial spaces, clear? So, they will have concrete canals in which you bury the waste in a container and then close it. Whatever problem you are going to envisage in this situation? I have created a situation, is this correct? And just now we said, we discussed that most of these radioactive waste is also going to be at elevated temperature. So, this heat is going to interact with the concrete of the vaults 
which you have created over a period of time. And then what will happen slowly and slowly? If you heat concrete, it's a good conductor of heat or bad conductor of heat? It's a bad conductor of heat. So it will crack. And once it cracks, it's a hazardous situation. How many examples I have given? So this is the need of the hour. I hope now you can understand why you know subject is becoming so exciting and we do not know anything actually. So more and more R&D is required, more and more understanding of the material is required. Clear? Most of the tiles which you are making, reflexes which you are making, you know you, you have to design a different type of foundation system for the fuel tanks, the places where the fuel, the fueling is going on in the offshore environment, onshore environment, you know, otherwise what will happen? There are static charges, static charges may trigger a fire. So all this is becoming a part of now our activity. Okay, so apart from thermal, electrical characterization becomes very, very important. So you just cited the example of the static charges in the world. So the fire that may be caused about that's correct so one fact is that there could be static charges i don't know how many of you have got a chance to go to a power station in power station they have transmission towers and how do they place transmission towers on the ground there are people who are working there understand so sometime when you get a chance please go and see the a substation or a power station from where they either step down or step up the power for transmission purpose so they design a very different foundation system so that the static charges don't affect number 2 you know short circuiting of the human beings how short, short, short circuiting will take place? The moment you have kept your foot here, what is going to happen? You will get short circuited or you touch something. The whole body may get short circuited. So all these are under the static currents. That is the reason when you go to a petrol pump, they always ask you to switch off your mobile phone. Mm. Because these are static currents which are sitting on the material and the moment you trigger them, there could be a fire. Now apart from this, what is your feeling, where the electrical properties of geomaterials will be useful and why somebody should study them? So the power transmission cables that we talked done. about. Done. All this is done. Next. When a thunderbolt, is, uh, when, when a thunderbolt strikes a ground Correct. or in case of a transmission from a rooftop to earth. Correct. In those cases. So this is where again you talk about the earthing capacity of the geomaterial soils particularly and then electrical conveyance or the charge conveyance to the geomaterial should be as easy as possible. Otherwise what will happen? A lot of heat which gets generated. Apart from this, come to more scientific era. No, we are talking about in 21st century what is happening. Why electrical properties are required? Where do you use them? No, semiconductor by soils, we are not talking about the semiconductor, no, directly. Yes, you are right. So, surface charges, correct. But under static conditions, they are not going to do anything, is it not? But the moment they come in contact with the flowing charge, there could be a current. Yes, you are right. Apart from this, there is also static charge by the way on the surface of the grains. Sensors, all sorts of sensors, so we are now in an age where everything is being sensed and what type of sensors are these? Either they are thermal sensors or they are 
electrical sensors fine so most of the sensors are working on the principle of either the current measurement or voltage measurement this is all right in other words they talk about the electrical properties of the geomaterials apart from this there are several techniques of sensing what is lying beneath the ground you must have done in your basic courses reconnaissance suppose if i want to establish what is the depth of the clay if i want to establish where is the water table if i want to establish where the ore is how to do all these things yeah gpr you can use that's right fine so there are also electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic waves are going to measure the dielectric constant of the material so these are slightly very very you know intense topics to study so i'm not going to study uh, discuss about them much in details i'm just giving you idea about where we are exactly right now in the subject fine you must got a idea about sensing techniques which is based on electrical properties of the geomaterials magnetic properties <coughs> so these are all interrelated when you talk about electrical properties the effect is magnetic when you talk about magnetic the effect is electrical so <coughs> these are basically conjugate to each other magnetic properties are also being used for measurement of discontinuities in the material abnormalities in the material and most important is moisture content so if i want to measure the in situ moisture content this could be for agriculture purpose it could be for designing a liner system it could be for placing the cables ac ducts whatever if i am doing moisture content profiling either electrical properties or magnetic properties become important clear yeah. so that is the reason why people are trying to spend lot of time on this those of you who are interested in understanding the importance of magnetic properties should read the paper which has been published by my phd scholar dr sushal lakshmi five days back it has been published in applied clay science dr sushal lakshmi and myself and uh, professor Mar mariam from electrical engineering so we have published a paper on how to determine magnetic properties of soils check it on research kit it's a upcoming area uh, i think lot of things are so and last but not the least is effect of radiation so now the recipe is complete we only talk about maybe a little bit of mineralogy we talk about a little bit of chemistry we talk about a little bit of physical properties but this is what the requirement is and hence research becomes mandatory so all these things are related to advanced instrumentation please remember because as i said uh, nobody has time now to go to the field and get the sample we are living in a electronic age and where sensing has become very very important so even if you are doing gpr gps sensing with all electromagnetic waves you are using but do we take uh, the economics and the availability of the geomaterials that we are investigating do we take the economics and the availability of the geomaterial that we are investigating that is economics like the availability the price at which it would be available that is also very yeah important. see as a project in charge definitely you like to save money but then there are situations where you want the best possible gadgets to be used for the best possible answers so complete data recording which you are doing i mean like there is nobody who will compromise on the quality of the data how would you monitor the entire project otherwise the availability of the geomaterial that we are investigating yeah so many a times you have to select a geomaterial for a specific purpose there these properties might be useful clear yeah. so is both ways 
how are you going to use this information to select a material or after selecting how are you going to place it and what you are going to do with it is a chef's job. You have to create a recipe. All right. So, basically geometrical characterization deals with primarily physical, chemical, mineralogical, thermal and electrical properties. Effect of radiation on soils is still not much quantified and people are working on it. Biological, I have not included here intentionally because this is in a very preliminary stage. The subject complexities are so much, it is not easy to for us to master it right now. So, we are just trying to understand first of all what is the species of the bacteria or the microbes or the fungi which is present in the system and what will be the reaction and all it is all in the preliminary stages right now. But yes, there are many people who are working in this area. And the idea is that how all these properties are going to alter or influence the geotechnical properties of the materials. Because ultimately my idea is to safeguard my structures which are going to be built up in a deposit of let us say marine clay which are very vulnerable to most of these energy fields which I talked about and they should remain trouble free. Now what has happened in the due course of time is people like our Puneet Kati. So, they have started working in this area like THMC which is a fashion right now. Why? Because nuclear industry wants us to give solution. Where are you going to dispose of waste, nuclear waste? You were talking about underground you know buried cables and so many energy. We, we forgot about foundations for the forges, foundations for the uh, you know forging units, foundation for the furnaces. Imagine whatever foundations you will provide to the furnaces, the temperatures are so high, smelting units. I mean, these are all practical problems. So, when you talk about these issues, this PHMC becomes a very important thing that is thermo hydromechanical models in geotechnical engineering. This is the recent trend, and one of the topmost applications of this is atomic waste disposal and design of buffers. how thermal properties or temperature effects are influencing the hydrological and mechanical response of the material is what people are trying to study. These are two fundamental properties of soils and rocks, how permeation takes place through them, how much compressible they are, what is the elastic modulus, what is the strength, what is the compressibility and what is the poison ratio. So, yeah, if you give us these parameters, we can design any system. Now, the question is how heating is going to influence it, okay. You talked about this when you were interacting with them, THMC, you have discussed with them. So, he has already talked about these issues. Particularly, the areas where the landslides are taking place, that is the recent thought why landslides are occurring, what is the micro mechanics of landslides. So, this is where people talk about the thermo hydromechanical models, loss in strength, gain in strength because of heating effects, fine. What are buffers? Buffer is something which is in between, cushion, alright. So, normally what is done is, so, suppose this is the ground surface and I am disposing, I have created a vault here, underground space, this I have dug out and somewhere here I am going to dispose the waste which is at elevated temperature. Now, if you dump the waste like this, what is going to happen? The attributes of the waste are high chemical concentration, 
high radioactive concentration, high temperatures, different type of gases and so on. Now, if you dump it over here, what is going to happen? Sorry? And this distance could be varying from few tens of meters to few hundreds of meters, depending upon how much isolation you want of this material from the geoenvironment. The closer it is and if it is of high potency, you are going to take a risk, understand? So, if it is of very high potency, you are going to dispose it quite deep inside. Now, my question is, if I just dump it over here like this and this formation is going to be at depths, this is going to be mostly rocks or sometimes it could be soils. What is going to happen in this situation? So, what is going to happen? The moment you dump it like this, because of the heat associated with this, this whole system is going to crack. And once it cracks, what is going to happen? Yeah, because water table is somewhere, even if say I take the deepest portion, most of the atomic power plants are close to the water bodies. So, truly speaking, this water bodies are going to create uh, this of the order of maximum 10 meters or so, less than that in fact. That means the entire thing is going to be water saturated most of the time. So you are right. The moment you put this material over here, it comes in contact with the geomaterials which are rocks and soils. The chances are because of very high temperatures, the system will crack. You want to stop this process, what should I do? Create a cushion create a transition zone. That zone is known as a buffer. Got the answer? So, if I fill up this space with a buffer material, which is not going to allow the waste to come in direct contact with geomaterials, my job is done. So, it has become a sort of a cushion between the two. So, this is a buffer material. A lot of research is being done in designing a good buffer material. Government of India spends enough money every year to bring the materials from different places, different mines and people like us are contacted to characterize them and give them a solution. Atomic energy gets linked to geotechnical engineering and environmental geotechnics beautifully. And I hope you can realize now we cannot be non nuclear. You agree? Can we remain non nuclear? I think those are all capitalist mindset because of which we are facing that these also problems. Gets linked over here, by the way. It's all a beautiful example of capitalism and socialism also. Because the place where you are going to bury the entire thing, you know, socialist issues start from here only. Hey, anyway, come back to the point. Yes, so, so can we remain non-nuclear? What about the medicines which our patients require? What about the power? Forget about the bombs. What about the power which society requires? medicines, power, electricity and of course, the arsenal which you require to become a, a strong nation. So, I mean like this is so important you see, now you are realizing environmental geotechnics talks about the muscle power of the country. These are the issues which nobody can handle. You can't design a metal here. So, what you have to do is you have to design a buffer, that is what I have written there. So, THMC is a beautiful example of designing the buffer materials which are dealing with mostly geomaterials. These buffers are nothing but mixtures of different type of 
bentonites, clays, clay minerals, and sands. Clear? And the type of properties which we are looking for are they should act like a sealant, water should not enter into it. Clear? Heat should not go out. You see what I did? I just changed the context in one microsecond. I said water should not enter into it and heat should not come out of it. Have you ever seen a valve like this where the flux goes only in one direction? So I am saying heat should not go outside, water should not go in. Gases which are getting generated because of the radioactivity of the material should not come out. Look at my expectations from the material. Are you realizing? At the same time, this material, though it is a buffer material which contains natural materials like clays and sands, should sustain very high temperatures. Fine? Because if it does not sustain very high temperature, again the same problem, problem will happen. At the same time, they should dissipate heat also slowly. So, they should remain in contact with the parent material. We call them as a host material. So, many properties are required to be handled at the same time. Clear? And apart from this, this buffer material should be compacted properly. If you are not compacting it properly, how would you place something on the top of this? So, most of the time, what do they do is they compact it before putting the waste. And once the waste has been put, again they compact and close this. This is what is known as post closure. Check it on net. There are beautiful examples internationally what type of research is being done in environmental geotechnics related to post closure. Post closure, after closing the systems, and how do they maintain it, particularly in nuclear industry. So, the worthiness of this material has to be checked against all these type of parameters, energy fluxes and so on. Now, this part normally I deal in environmental geomechanics. I am not going to discuss much in environmental geotechnics. So, to sum it up, compactibility is an issue, water permeability is an issue, gas permeability is an issue, strength is an issue, thermal worthiness is an issue, thermal integrity is an issue how long the system can sustain heat, it should not get decomposed. Check for all this material. Now, another possibility could be, now from this point onwards the entire thing is moving into the bio realm, that is a different issue altogether. Because once you go deep down inside the ground, aerobic anaerobic conditions might exist and then this system itself is prone to bioactivity. Now, when I use the word prone, it has both the consequences. Apart from the buffers and all, I mean, one more, uh, like naturally, soil gets exposed to this. Uh, I mean, daily, you know, daily variations of temperature, also the seasonal variations of temperature, and a lot of unsaturated soil mechanics also gets involved because there might be a phase transformation of water getting evaporated to the gaseous phase. So, then the poor air pressure, poor water pressure, all of them makes the uh, behavior more complicated. Very nice. So, he is hinting on climate sciences and climate. what is the influence of climate science on the properties of the geomaterials. Because what he says is solar cycle, wind speed, and both of them, what do they do? They will heat up the soil mass on the surface. <coughs> this heat goes inside, moisture comes out. Some of the soils will crack, some of the soils will become unsaturated and so on. So, this is where the climate science gets directly linked with geotechnical engineering. Very nice. The response of the soils to the climatic changes. Yes, please carry on. I think uh, this is a very interesting thought, yes. This was one point I think. Correct. Next. Yes, yeah, so he is talking about application. Look at the domain of 
you know, activities which you are supposed to do uh, when you deal with uh, geotechnical engineering as such. Pay stage can occur in the form of evaporation as well as it can also occur in the form of solidification. Means freezing can occur if the ambient conditions are sub freezing. Good. Yes. Freezing temperatures. Permafrost. So you see, you, you must have realized in two, three minutes the whole context has got changed. <clears throat> you know, climate directly communi communicating with the geomaterials. He talks about drying effect, he talks about permafrost effect. This whole dynamics is different. The mechanics part is totally different. Is this part okay? Yes. We were talking about ground improvements in the geothermal piles. Piles in order to improve the shear strength, shear strength and solid uh, shear strength of the soil that can also be one of the questions. So, with the application of heat, moisture will be migrating away from it, and again, the, the rate at which this increase in strength is occurring because of the consolidation that is improved in case we use it along with some other methods. Application of geotechnics in those domains is uh, generally not recognized, but it is a major contributor. Ground improvement by freezing and heating, we did not talk about. It is a beautiful example of THMC. So, suppose you are doing tunneling in a highly fractured, weathered rock, rock mass, like Himalayas, you know. most of the passes which you are doing tunnel in these days. So the best is because you cannot seal all these cracks. Now what you can do is you can locally freeze the entire system. So that becomes cohesive. We call it local anesthesia before operations. So once you have frozen the entire soil mass and the ground soil mass and the rock mass, now you can cut beautifully a big tunnel out of it, maintain the air conditioning for that moment. And once the tunneling is done, you provide good liners and remove the air conditioning part. Anesthesia and job is over. Operation done successfully. And a beautiful example. Heating I can do to decontaminate the soils. See, most of the soils which are contaminated with hydrocarbons, VOCs, all right, different type of chemicals which have volatility. What I can do? I can design a heating system so that I can get rid of the contaminants from the soils. Another application. So if you want to improve the soils which are contaminated, this seems to be a very good idea around heating, controlled heating. Become an expert in this subject. There is nobody to compete with you, I am telling you. Sir, talking about ground improvement. Then the conventional techniques like uh, using PVDs, you know, for uh, you, you can enhance the uh, performance of the PVDs um, by heating the system. Very good. So these, co yeah, I think I discussed this in the class. Yes, if you remember, some one of you or some of you, uh, the PVDs can be fitted with the heaters. Yes, you are right. Excellent. Or you can inject hot air itself. See, these techniques you should master, you know, all of you, one, one in your lifetime and, and become an expert. And there are so many patients, believe me. Are you getting the point? 350, 370 major post mining sites are lying in the country which are totally unattended right now and where these technologies have to be implemented. This is the magnitude of the work which is waiting for you, which you should take it up, which you should try to, you know, form a team and then execute it. The design of foundation, when we are designing files in case of permafrost or frozen area, in that case, the add freezing strength, that is the strength due to the contact between the piles and the frozen soil, that is taken into account. So 
that is different from the strength which is taken in, taking into account the unfrozen side. So my primary and primary domain in the frozen or permafrost in that case it is the cohesion or the strength uh, which is gained because of the contact between frozen side and the frozen side. Another beautiful example would be uh, two days back there was a Brahmos test fire, is it not? Two days back, India has done successful test fire of a Brahmos missile. What type of conditions you are going to create? The amount of heat which goes, how would you isolate the entire area from the rest of the areas? Another good example would be when you are testing your detonator. You know, different type of bombs and shells, particularly atomic bombs, rocket launching pad. So when you are designing all this, and these things become very, very essential. I hope you can get a feel of, you know, what are the activities, how much heat gets generated when you do underground explosions, and how to contain it, how to contain it so that it doesn't affect the populace nearby. Otherwise, nobody will allow you to do this type of tests in the of Kutch or anywhere. Fine. So, these are the issues which you have to talk about. Yes. Uh, one thing which I uh, hmm. observed in like when all of them submitted 10 questions for their mid-sem, most of them had a question related to underground fire. Hmm. Oh, yes. Wonderful. That itself get link, get link. Very nice. Please elaborate it because I think uh, though we discussed this in the class, but you can elaborate. Yes. I, mean, I, 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 get, I guess it's self-explanatory when there are underground fires. I just remind them <coughs> quickly. So, in case of underground fires, obviously… Most of the time in mines, coal mines. Yeah. In fact, uh, there are still, uh, you know, we have mines um, at this moment which are under fire. Since so many years. Yeah, since so many years. I think one in Jhansi. So, so yeah. wherever you have coal, people are rich, no doubt, but they have a lot of problems. And I think I discussed in the class, there was a section of railways which got cut off yes. between Raipur and uh, between Raipur and there is a small town, you might be knowing, 36 kilometer of the railway track, they had to stop flying of railways because of underground fire. So, this is a beautiful example again what you have cited. <coughs>